Hi, my name is Rachel and today we're talking about A River of Royal Blood by Amanda Joy. First of all, shout out to Garrison for sending me this copy. Garrison, you are the best. But also shout out to Stephanie who commissioned this review for her birthday. Happy birthday, Stephanie. Hey, I'm late on this video because I'm getting over strep throat. <laughs> Stephanie did not like this book and DNF'd it. I finished it and I have complicated thoughts on it. I mean, maybe not complicated. I have many thoughts on it. It's got a lot of stuff that I love. Sibling rivalry, blood magic, shadow magic on a side character. It's not the most prominent thing. Unfortunately, I didn't love it and I was really hoping I would. I was hoping that Stephanie and I just had completely different tastes, but unfortunately I can't understand why she DNF'd this book. I'm gonna give you my, well I'm gonna give you the synopsis, I'm gonna give you my basic rundown of thoughts and then we're gonna get into a spoilery entire review of what happens in the book. I mean at least I'm hoping that we can do that if you know my Wi-Fi wants to connect and let me do my job. A River of Royal Blood is a North African inspired fantasy. It is YA. It is about sibling rivalry. Well, no, it's... Okay, so actually here's where we get into the issues. The synopsis says it's about sibling rivalry and I don't really feel like that's true. I mean, we don't really see that very much. And like the cover certainly implies it. That's what I thought that we were getting. And what we got is fine. It's just, it's not what I thought that we were going to do. So entirely reading this book, I kept waiting for that to happen. And it didn't until the very end. And I didn't feel like all that lead up led to a good payoff. Now, this is not like the worst thing I've ever read. To be honest with you, I gave this three stars. I think that it's fine. I think that what would have fixed this for me would have been just taking because this is a duology I think that we should have just taken both books and put them into one book I think that the story if I if I'm guessing right where the story goes the story would have been best served by putting it in a standalone because honestly it's not just the sibling rivalry that didn't pay off we didn't do payoff with basically any of the the story ideas they all just sort of led off in their own directions and we didn't wrap anything up which is something that I really get frustrated with there's a series that I should like I mean I like the characters in this and there's a another series in this that I felt similarly where I really like the characters I like the idea I like the setup I like the theme but we don't actually go anywhere and I'm so sorry to tell you that it's this book by Maureen Johnson that I can't remember the name of I really like the main character I like the writing I like what we're doing but there's not a story arc here that bothers me it's a similar thing happening here. Let me give you the synopsis. 16 year old Eva is a princess born with the magic of marrow and blood, a dark and terrible magic that hasn't been seen for generations in the vibrant but fractured country of Myri. Its last known practitioner was Queen, Queen Reina, who toppled the native Chimera royalty and ma massacred thousands, including her own sister, eight generations ago, thus beginning the rival heir tradition. Living in Reina's long and dark shadow, Eva must now face her older sister, Issa, in a battle to the death if she hopes to ascend the ivory throne, because in in the queendom of Myri, only the strongest, most, most ruthless rulers survive. When Eva is attacked by an assassin just weeks before the battle with her sister, she discovers there is more to the attempt on her life than meets the eye, and it isn't just her sister who wants to see her dead. As tensions escalate, Eva is forced to turn to a fae instructor, instructor of mythic proportions and a mysterious and handsome Chimaer prince for help in growing her magic into something to fear. But despite the love she still has for her sister, Eva will have to choose Issa's death or her own. Now, I will tell you that this book has just I think such a great map it's really pretty I really like the map and it was really helpful for me because I, I felt a little confused uh, in, in certain parts of I had to refer to the map and the map helped me but if you're reading the audiobook you might have trouble I tandem read this and I would have to refer back to the map and pause the audiobook in order to uh, figure out where we were however uh, I will also say that the audiobook production I think that the narrator did a really good job bringing the story and the characters to life so if you are an art audiobook reader audiobook production is good. So her mom very obviously like favors her sister so we have a little bit of mommy issues in here however I don't feel like we really got the most out of that um, in the way that we did with like Ray Bearer. Ray Bearer I felt really nailed in a duology format looking at what it means for you to have mommy issues as a girl which is one of my favorite things because oh girl same same here. She is closer with her dad who doesn't appear on page much and in fact I would say that a lot of the side characters and we have a lot kind of fall off the map quite a bit in a way that doesn't really bring out the most in all of them. I would say that the most page time we got for side characters was Baka, who is the fey instructor of mythic proportions, who teaches her how to use her magic because up till now she does not know how to use her magic and you find out why, but even that I don't feel like was a great payoff. So Baka is really great in, in bringing out the richness of the story. I think that her scenes with Baka were the best parts of the whole book. I think that their relationship, which was very interesting, some, I 
I saw somebody in a review say that they thought that there was going to be a romance between the two. I did not think so and I'm really glad that we did not go that direction. Baka is her instructor. He's also a bisexual king so good for him but he's really there to teach her and he's also there to you, you don't really know if you can trust him. He's really interesting and he brings a lot of richness to the world because he tells you the stories of queen of the queens of the past who he had some interactions with and so you learn about the world and its history mostly through Baka teaching our main character Eva which is a setup that I think really worked well for this world in teaching us about the world's history and why it's relevant to our main character today. However I think that <laughs> the sister we barely saw on page so the sibling rivalry of this is basically non-existent. The romance that's here it would show up and it was really sweet and precious it's just it didn't get a lot of page time and I, I was left wondering like what really was the point of this? Again I think that that uh, all, both of these things really could have been better utilized in a standalone rather than a duology because this as it serves is just not delivering anything of like spectacular quality to me. I think the writing on a line level is good. I just think that unless you're willing to read these back to back both books one and two and they are both out I don't know that you're gonna have a good time. I have not read book two so I don't know if the story ends in a satisfying way but all of the plot that we're doing is not tied up at the end of this book so if that's important to you I would say prepare to read these back to back so that you're not like immediately disappointed. It ends kind of abruptly. Um, it, it stalled out in the middle pretty bad. We didn't, we have some mystery like who is trying to kill our main character and we don't actually learn that by the end. And then at the end we are introduced to even more mysteries about characters we didn't spend enough time in uh, with in this installment of this duology. So I think that if you're willing to give it a try it is unique magic. We have tattoo magic, blood magic. Our sister here Issa, she is able to wield illusions. Again she's not on page very much but if you like illusion magic she has that. We have a side character who's like a, a bodyguard of our main character Eva who is able to wield shadows which is pretty cool and Eva has blood and marrow magic so not just blood but marrow so like bone magic which gets into sort of you know a shadow and bone at towards the end the Alina Starkov thing with the what was it an elk the, with the horns it's kind of like that it's like an amplifier of power. Pretty cool I, I like bone magic. I don't see it that enough and I would like to see more so if you're looking for a book with that this has that. If you like the magical mentor trope this has that. I also really liked our main character. I think that she's a good main character. She's inquisitive. She's smart. She asks very basic necessary questions. Again the book is fine. I just think that it could have utilized its plot points better and not stalled out so much in the end. Probably would have worked for me better as a standalone uh, especially because I feel like the mommy issues are really going to be more explored in book two and I would have liked to see them more explored here. That's my non-spoiler review. Let me tell you what happened in the book because I still think that this is like going to be a five-star book for somebody, some of you. It just wasn't for me. So if you don't want any spoilers and you want to try it out and see if it is that book for you, check it out and I will leave you here. If you want to hear about what happened and all of my thoughts on it, here we go. So we have humans, we have fae, we have these beings called chimeres which are humans but they have, they have like horns and stuff and they are treated as lesser than than the humans because of some political things that happened in the past that we learn about through Baka, our magical mentor. We have Bloodkin, which are basically vampires. Eva's, our, our main character Eva, her older sister Issa, has the imag magical illusions ability and she would definitely weaponizes this against certain people. She sort of was hot and cold. I felt like, like in some scenes she was quite nice and then other scenes she's like using her magic for evil and being kind of mean to our main character but she really only showed up in the present in about I'd say like three scenes. Mostly we got flashbacks, not even mostly, I'd say we got about three flashbacks of them growing up together. Overall we just didn't really do the sibling rivalry as much as I had hoped. When they were kids Eva hurt her sister Issa with her magic which she has no control over. She was born of marrow and blood magic under a blood moon which sounds cool as fuck honestly but she cannot control it. Her and her sister were closer when they were younger and then at 13 she would found out that she would either kill or be killed by her sister Issa. When their dad left their mom Issa stayed and Eva our main character ran away to live with their dad for a while and she had just recently come back to the palace at the beginning of our story. In the beginning of the book somebody tries to kill her and this is against the rules for um, the sisters to try to kill each other before the official 
special birthday of the youngest sibling when they do the ritual and, and it begins where they actually have to kill each other and when they do this magical ritual neither of them um, can be killed by anybody else only each other I'm honestly not sure how this works and like why we don't do this with like everybody what if you just bond yourself to another person to make it so that like nobody can kill you except you two you know what I mean there are priests and priestesses essentially who make prophecies and stuff she goes to talk to some of them trying to figure out I mean it's kind of a big deal if somebody tried to murder you she ended up murdering the guy who tried to murder her and she's trying to figure out what's going on she's trying to figure out like I need to access my magic before I get into this fight with my sister I need to ask access my magic now in order to protect myself so in this library when she goes with her priests and priestesses her and her best friend who's also one of her guards they're walking around this library and she sort of gets like this pull to go into this particular area and she just happens to stumble upon Baka our magical fae mentor who is very old he's very well known he doesn't look old but he is very old as is you know the typical deal with <laughs> with fantasy, fantasy books everybody's you know 500 years old so in one singular chapter I'm serious she stumbles upon Baka this well-known old fae who knew the queens of the past has been running around the world doing god knows what she meets him talks to him finds out that he could bond to her to help her use her magic and and like vice versa they could help each other out and in one 19 minute chapter we meet, are introduced to, have an understanding of Baka, are told that we can bond to him to utilize our magic and he'll tutor her and then we're bound to him. This all happened in one 19 minute chapter. Like it, I, it just, it came out of nowhere. I like Baka, don't get me wrong. Again, bisexual king, blood magic. I just felt like this intro happened so suddenly and she made this decision so quickly. She binds her magic to Baka, but she keeps like this tutelage a secret from her mom initially, though I'm not really sure what the necessity of that was because she ends up just like a few chapters later telling her mom oh here's Baka my tutor. Baka tells her while she, they are you know learning about her magic that there's a binding on her magic and this has been keeping her from being able to use it and it's honestly hurting her and she starts to wonder like who would have done this who would have bound my magic. Now you can see that she has tattoos we're not just doing tattoo magic which the humans need in order to bring the magic to the surface which is awesome really like the magic here. Um, we're also doing blood magic which is really cool and then later bone magic. Baka teaches her about the Chimere who are the people with like horns and stuff. Their history, their politics. The Chimere are kept by her people, the humans, in enclosures and they have like their own area that they are enclosed off from. They are seen as less than. Her dad was very kind to the Chimere people but her mom really doesn't have much love for them. So then one day a Chimere prince named Prince Akito is assigned to her guard duty and she explains to him if she became queen that she changed things because the Chimere were once in power but then they were usurped and now they're treated like animals and there is you know some initial hints that her and the prince have some attraction to each other. She starts to think that her own father might have put this um, dampener on her power, this this binding, this magical binding, and her parents are separated. Her dad lives up in the north. He's still considered king but he doesn't live with them and her mom is the one that's in charge because this is a queendom, this is a matriarchy. He sends one of her guards, Dakin, down in this. I don't understand this scene because because this man again this all happened so quickly she missed her guard she's so happy to see him he's like we should spar we, we just met back up let's spar immediately and during them sparring he enters some sort of trance and the guy ends up dead and so they believe that whoever sent the assassin in the beginning of the book to kill her is likely also responsible for this we're at about 40 percent now and the sister showed up once in the beginning of the book like you know kind of messed around with her and and you know used her her illusions magic very lightly and then left at this point it doesn't seem like uh, while I was reading I was like oh so we're not doing a lot of sibling rivalry here like it, the cover and the synopsis seem to convey. I thought that we were gonna get a whole book about like a battle to the death between siblings. It's more of a who's trying to kill me but we're also doing a lot of things at once and I started at this point to lose hope that any of it was gonna get enough page time to really make an impact on me as a reader despite me liking the ideas. I like the introduction of most of these ideas it's just we didn't actually 
really have them pan out in a way that felt very satisfying. So at this point she's been thinking, why would my dad put a dampener on my power to harm harm me? And Mirabelle, which I can't hear without thinking of Encanto because I have kids, a Mirabelle is her guardian and honestly her stand-in mother because she definitely needs a stand-in mother because her mom does not care about her. Her stand-in mom Mirabelle tells her, it's not possible that your father would have put a dampener on your power to harm you. It would have been to help you. So they have this meeting between Baca and Eva and the queen. So she tells her mom, here's Baca. He's been training me. By the way, I would like to go see my dad. Can I take Baca and some guards and can I go see dad? And the queen says, sure, you can go take this round trip journey that's going to take like a month, but you need to be back in time for your birthday because you know, you have to fight your sister to the death. Children of divorce, am I right? Eva only wants to go to ask her dad about the binding and doesn't feel comfortable doing this by letter, which I thought was a bit of a cop out and sort of a very convenient plot device so that we could get to the part that we're about to get to. I'll come back to that in a second. So the queen mentions to Baca in, at this meeting that Eva loved one particular story about him because he's this like mythic fae, right? And Baca isn't happy about this. In the story, a girl stole from the queen of that time and the queen told Baca to give her a fate worse than death. So he took the girl away as his bride and after she'd fallen in love with him, he killed her, at least according to the story. And in response to this, he tells Eva, in those days, princess, an oath to the queen was done in blood. It was impossible to obey. obey. I like the story, but it seemed in a very heavy handed way, it was showing that Baca was forced to do this and hinting that Baca is still under like blood oath to do other things and we don't know what they are. I kind of wish that he had played it off like it wasn't a big deal to keep up this like pretense of him being this like hardened fae being who doesn't care about mortals and then we find out who he really is later. After this they're leaving and Baca meets her sister Issa and her Issa's friends and they're like why are you here my guy? You're like a super old mythical fae dude and he's like oh I'm here because I think Eva can win and he's like really haughty and making them uncomfortable. It was, it was quite funny. And right here Eva asks Issa did you have a hand in the attacks against me? And Issa's like no I did not. That's against the law anyways. So we're still not getting any answers. We're after 40% at this point. We're at 50% at this point and we're still not getting anywhere on learning who tried to kill Eva. Instead we flash back and we see Eva at 13 years old hanging out with her sister and that her sister misuses magic on people and tries to use ma her magic to force Eva to use her magic and then tells her mom that Eva is the one misusing the, her magic and their mom very clearly tends to favor the older sister Issa. After this point is when they were no longer allowed to spend any time together and her mom tells her about the rivalry and that they are going to have to fight to the death. And that is when Eva ran away at 13 to go live with their dad. Up to this point, Baca it was my favorite character and um, he sort of fell off being my favorite character sort of the end, or the end. I sort of felt middle of the road about everybody other than Eva who I liked. But up to this point, I really like Baca. I like his snark and I like using him to fill in the gaps in knowledge, especially about the chimeras because it's going to be important later on about the chimeras being in charge. And the history stories that he tells are actually pretty brutal and fascinating and just again add like a really good richness. There was one story where it was like we have a princess and a fae prince and they came um, to meet each other and they were like what if we combine our lines and they were like well the king will never allow it so they just like leave having killed the king so that they can combine the lines and live in peace which was kind of kind of cool. However despite Baka giving her all this information she still doesn't trust Baka. She doesn't understand understand where did you come from before you were here? Why are you here? Why did you return to our country? And she has suspicions that he's lying to her or going to betray her. Prince Akito, the Chimera Prince, who really does not get enough page time, is sparring with her. I appreciate again that she's been sparring for years and that this isn't one of, a, another one of those scenes where it's like the bodyguard teaches the princess how to defend herself should she need it. I like that she you know can hold her own already. I don't I don't need one training scene <laughs> per fantasy book. So Prince Akito tells her he can feel her admiring him because of his chimera powers. He has like empathy as a chimera power, like he can sense emotion and she's really into him so he can tell. 
well, which like good for them. I hope it works out and doesn't go horribly wrong. <laughs> and Akito lets it slip that he's kind of into her too. It's cute. It's precious. It's a nice like little romance. Baka up to this point has been teaching her blood magic and he tells her, all right, it's time to use your other magic, which is marrow magic, the other part of the affinity that she was born into. But he took her out at night and she's like, I can't see anything. We are in the dark. And he's like, oh, I, I forgot that you humans can't see in the dark. How funny. And this is actually funny. I laughed at this. But he teaches her to use her alternate sight, basically. They kill an antelope and she claims the horns of it to bond herself to. So she wears a bone ring already that binds her magic with his. And I really like bone magic. We see it in Shadow and Bone. We saw it in Bone Crier's Moon, which I didn't love the book, but I really like the magic in. It's a cool idea, but we're at almost 60% in at this point, And we aren't doing a ton with anything bone magic, with the relationships, with the actual plot. So I assume at this point we're not going to do much with the bone magic either. Prince Akito, the Chimera Prince, starts telling her more about his life growing up and how Chimeras are forced to live in enclosures and his grandma is considered a leader of the Chimera within the enclosures and she takes care of everybody and he had a tough time growing up because of his empath power. He just takes on a lot of other people's emotions. While he's explaining all this to Eva, they have been on this journey, right? Right? They are traveling north to see her dad, to go ask her dad about the binding on her magic. She's been doing all this stuff, talking to Akito, training with Baka and getting the antelope while they've been traveling, right? And it's dangerous. Her mom had her bring a bunch of guards with her. So Prince Akito is telling her about his life growing up and <laughs> they realize that somehow they missed a bunch of screaming going on and their traveling party that they were a little bit a ways away from back at camp is under attack. How you missed screaming, I don't know. They fight off their attackers, which are a whole raid of men who are Dracolin, which is not where they're from. A few of them got away. They aren't sure who sent these men in the first place, but assumedly the same person who's behind the other two attacks on Eva. They get to her, where her dad lives in the north and he says that he didn't tell her anything about binding her magic because of the omens, such as a black sun and a blood moon that were around her birth, and he didn't have her severed completely, so there were omens that he was concerned about regarding her magic so he bound it but he didn't have it severed from her completely he, d he was just limiting her greatest powers because of these omens however the binding that he had placed upon her makes using her magic painful for her and okay I just again I feel like I'm not sure why this couldn't have been done in a letter this is where the book really should have been starting to pick up and it didn't hit its stride so her dad tells her that uh, the guy who placed the bindings on her he had hired to place the bindings on her that same guy he was having learn about blood and marrow magic to help her and that guy was murdered a while ago and her dad never found someone else to teach her so they're just chilling at her dad's house okay Baka tells her more about himself that he's still under a blood of that only ends with his death and that there are things that he cannot tell her because of it. But he swore an oath not to kill her so she can at least trust that. Then he gives her the horns of the antelope she killed and the marrow magic is, you know, Im imbued and shit. And so she wears these horns around her throat much like Alina Starkov and it brings out her her power. Her father is then attacked and murdered in his room. And I guess that this is the reason that, and it feels like a plot convenience, this is the reason why we could not do this via letter because we needed to get there, have him answer a couple questions, and then have this very emotional moment where he is now dead. He's attacked and murdered in, in his room. There's a bunch of blood everywhere. And her, one of her bodyguards, Annalie, the one with the shadow magic, comes to her and tells her, you killed one of the assassins. And Eva's like, I did? When? She doesn't remember doing this at all. They believe the assassins are Drakarin, the same people who attacked them on the way there. And Eva says, sure, but there's no way that the Drakarins did this on their own. And she realizes that someone powerful has has to be involved. So they gather for her father's funeral and the funeral scene was, uh, this is really interesting, it was very brutal. They have a magical fire that burns and burns for hours so that his ashes can slowly scatter across the land. And the royal family has to stand there for the entirety of the burning, all these hours of him burning. This is a really cool idea. I really do appreciate like the pieces of world building that are in here and like the, the way that we like really made this very unique culture. So then we're getting close to her birthday she starts talking about, and this is where I was like, oh, the mommy issues are coming out. I thought we were really 
really gonna have like this big moment sort of like we did in Ray Bear where I was like oh ouch that really it still hurts my feelings thinking about the the ultimate like the 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 final like moment between her and her mom where her mom tells her like I don't care about you <laughs> So she starts talking, thinking about how she's like boxing up parts of her mom, compartmentalizing them, except for the part of her mom that is the queen. And in a, in a way, she talks about in a way having to do this with her sister as well. And I like this, it made sense as a coping mechanism. It just, again, unfortunately, her mom, her sister, her friend, her guy friend Fallon, who's like also, you know, part of her guard, Prince Akito, everybody really except Baka just does not get enough page time. They all just fall off the map for so many chapters and are not used like fluidly, like in, in, with a lot of continuity that I just don't feel like they really got enough page time to bring the most out of them. They figure out that one of the nobles who's friends with her sister, which I had forgotten this person even was in this book, <laughs> they find out that he knows something. So Eva, Baka, and Chimera Prince Akito go to interrogate him. So Akito's empathy magic enhances other people's fear, which helps loosen this guy's tongue. And they ask him what he had to do with her father's death and he implicates his own mother, who is a noble. The issue with this, again, is I barely remember these people. I don't even remember their names now, having closed the book, because they hardly had any screen time, so this really is not making an impact. I mean, this, this guy was in maybe two brief scenes, and then after this, that guy, his brother, and his mom, they just, like, fuck off somewhere, and you don't learn any more about it. What ends up happening is they do the ritual so that, you know, they make it so that these, these two sisters are finally fighting. Eva has her birthday. The sisters, they finally have to fight. So they have her birthday and they're having a party. Nobody can kill Eva except her sister and vice versa, okay? At the party, she's Eva is dancing with a Prince Akito and she's like, do you want to come back to my room with me? And he's like, ah, oh, I, sh I shouldn't because I shouldn't do that. And it's, you know, awkward and she's frustrated. And she's like, oh, I thought he liked me. What the hell? So she's walking around and then she ends up um, wanting to leave and she's looking for Prince Akito again. And she realizes, is that not only is he gone, but her sister Isa is also gone. And immediately she's just like, Isa took Akito. And this just seemed really out of character for Isa. She didn't seem interested in hurting anybody prior to this. She didn't even seem interested in hurting her sister prior to this. Just this, I don't know, the tone shifted and, and everything went like really off the rails at the end. So they, her and Baka and Fallon, I believe her guy friend, who's also her guard, go to her sister Isa's rooms. They have to fight some of her guards. And Isa's like, yes, I took your your Prince Akito. And then suddenly we shift the conversation to, by the way, we're half sisters. Your dad's not my dad. And I'm like, okay, yeah, that makes sense. So why are we here? What did we, what did we achieve by capturing this Chimera Prince? She's like, dad was, Chi your dad was Chimera. My dad wasn't. Your Chimera. We're half sisters. We're barely sisters. I don't like you. And I'm like, this is a tonal shift that I was not prepared for and I'm not enjoying. So they're fighting and Eva's like, I don't want to kill you. And Eva is like, I have to kill you. I have to, it's, it's, I have to become queen. And I'm like, again, this just seems like a tonal shift. You weren't this like mean and catty and, and snappy before. And Eva's like, well, I don't believe that I'm, I'm Chimera. That doesn't make any sense. But it does. It makes total sense if you've watched the entirety of the book. I mean, you've seen Baka like explaining all this Chimera lore to her. And she's been saying how she wants to free the Chimera. And her dad was very nice to the Chimera. And now she's falling in love with a Chimera prince. So it makes a ton of sense actually. But for her sister to be like mad about it which just it just felt like out of nowhere so Eva inca incapacitates Isa and she's sort of left in a coma by the end basically what we're setting up for is Eva is half chimera and half human and she could unite the chimera and the humans and bring the chimeras from out from under the humans boots but she didn't kill her sister so the humans are not going to accept her but all these mysteries we led up to have not been solved I don't know who tried to kill Eva I don't know who killed her dad I don't know what happened to those people who were implicated in the murder of her dad I don't know what any of the point of this was if we were not going to answer those questions and in the end Baka is saying things like alluding to him not having having been fully honest with her. And he's having a conversation with Prince Akito, who also is alluding to not having been fully honest with her. And I'm like, sure, fine, you know, have some mysterious, like, what's going on here? But could we solve the mysteries that we had up to this point? I don't understand what happened. And then that's it. I guess we're gonna answer all those questions in the next book. I can understand why Stephanie DNF'd this. I think it has such cool ideas. I think, like, on a line level, the writing is very good. I think the characters are good, just a lot of them
then don't get enough page time. Just think that in plot, we didn't really finish anything that we started. And that's really frustrating, especially because in the middle, we really stalled in this book. And we kept like going through this whole like training with Baka, asking questions, training with Baka, asking questions about who's trying to kill me. We sort of got stuck on a wheel. And then eventually we, we, we got off the wheel, but then we didn't finish. Like it just, it just keeps going into the next book. And I'm like, wait, but finish one thing so that I can just be satisfied. Unfortunately, we didn't. I think I'll read the next book. I just, I don't, uh, it's really, I, I, I'm i worried that we're going to do more getting stuck on that wheel again, and it's going to take me forever to finish it. However, I am still interested enough to pick up the next book. I think I'd probably give this like a 3.25, somewhere around there. I just wish that it had finished something, you know what I mean? But I think we're doing some interesting stuff, and I think we have really cool magic. I just wish that, you know, certain things got more page time, and we'd tidied up some loose ends and finished a train of thought. <laughs> so I wouldn't call this like a mediocre 3.25. I would just call it a just finish it first. Like be done. I need I need closure. And like a duology that does do this very well again that has like a, a similar theme with the mommy issues thing is Ray Bear. The way that this ends we do solve one of the mysteries that we've been doing like the whole time but it gives you enough that we're doing plenty we have plenty to go, you know jump into in the next book that we're still interested in. And that's why it gets constant <laughs> visual on my shelves because it's one of my favorite. So maybe I'll like the next book better but this one eh, it's sitting at like a 3.25. Could have been better if we had just tidied up some loose ends. So let me know if you've read this and what your thoughts on it were. Let me know if you read the second book and if, if you feel like it, it tidied, tied up all those those loose ends and if the mommy issues gets delved into more in the second book because that's what I'm really interested in. All right thanks so much for watching. Thanks Stephanie for commissioning this. Happy birthday. Everybody say happy birthday Stephanie. I hope you enjoyed. Leave your comments and questions down below and I will see you next time. Bye. Hello it's Trash Can Rachel and before I go I have to say thank you for being a friend to my Therapy Bills patrons and those are Alexander, Brittany, Bubitney, Cammy, Choco's Waiting for Not All Men podcast, <laughs> Chris, Dalton, DJ Roctopus, Ellie, Emperor's New Blues, Aaron with two E's, Eric, Ethel Go Lightly, Galaxy Bot, Janaya, JC Murphy, Jack, Jess, Jesse, Jill, John E, Julie D, Kalein OK, Casey McKenzie, Kate W, Caitlin M, Quinn, Lady Kittybug, Lemon Jelly, Lex, Lily B, Max B, no relation, just same initial. I don't know why I felt the need to say that. Mixer Boneless, Alice, Panoramic Demon, Peggy Lou, Rachel C, Rain, Reese, SJ, Samar, Scarlet, Shiny, SMK, Spoopy, Steph B, Two Orbit, Chai Guy, and The Salem T. Lynn. Thank you all so much for being a friend and for being here. I appreciate you. And last but not least, before I go, I have to say thank you for being a friend to my Potato Starch Marks' patrons, and those are Alicia, Amanda, Andy, Angelica, Anita, Artie the Ninth, Ashley H, Ava, Ballads and Bookends, Beck, Blake Lemon Pant, Blythe Lavender, Bookish Bats, Bookish Brain Rot, Bree, Caitlin, Cardinal Ginger, Carlin, Casper, Kate W, Catherine, Kathy, Chris, CJ, Clementine, Cole, Colleen, Corwin, Cosmic, Danielle M, Darren, Deborah B, Diet Goth, Dilf Enthusiast, Dorian, Dorotea, E.T. Cosgrove, Ebby, Emerald Dodge, Emily A., Emily L., Emma, Aaron, Ezra Moon, Fiona M., Gadarn, I'm gonna need you to tell me how to say that, Hannah C., Harpy Kiro, Haley G., Ilianaka, India Inks, J.M. Tennant, J. is on Olympus, Jelly V., Jen Michelle, Gender Queer, Jenny G., Jessa Sue, Jillian, Jojo Bookish, Kai, Kat, Catherine, Katie L., Kaylee C., Kayala, Kendra, Kiara, Laughing Cat Dog, Laura, Lauren, Lazarus Ray, Library of Scars, Lindsay M., Lisa B, Lisa L, LP, Lou Siri, Lustful Octopus, Martin, Madison, Man Eating Plant, Marcella, Marquita, Malara, Mentally Unwell, May, Molly, James, Natalie, Never, Nicole G, Nicole R, Nyan Binary, Paige P, Penny Chilling, Fox Club, Rachel B, Reba, Rebecca, Rivy D, Ronnie, Rosie, Rowan, Sicoria, Sadie, Saya Riley, Sakia Lume, Samantha O, Sarah H, Sarah the Bear, Sarah Z, Shamed, Shannon, Sheen Onion, Sean, T. Delegati, Tay, Talia, Three Old Dogs, Tiana, Toast, Trash Can Teddy, Ty, Title Phoenix, and Writer A. Thank you all so much for being a friend. Mm -hmm.